everyone. So today we're going to be talking about uh, kind of our first new topic uh, that's going to be covered just solely by remote teaching. Um, so it's going to be a little bit of adjustment from uh, for all of us, but we're going to talk about today homogeneous nucleation. So this is uh, very similar, again, to this nucleation and growth topic, but now we're going to figure out, okay, well, why do, why do we want particles to go to nucleate in the first place? So why do particles, solid particles, start to appear from this like liquid solution. We know, again, from thermodynamics, from our lecture five, from phase diagrams, depending on the temperature and composition, what fraction of which will appear, but really fundamentally, thermodynamically, why do they occur? Like, why do we want to form this solid? Because we know when we form these solid precipitates, we know that there's gonna be some, uh, basically, area that separates your liquid and solid. That's gonna create this interface. Creating area is bad because we have to pay the energy penalty. So your delta G is going to increase. So why, why do we form a solid to begin with? What's the driving force to form a solid particle? Well, that's what we want to kind of understand and uh, basically answer today with this lecture, this homogeneous nucleation. So we're going to talk about nucle uh, homogeneous nucleation today. We're going to talk about steady state nucleation rates and what are the kind of these competing factors. And then in the next video, we'll talk about a little bit of a twist on uh, basically heterogeneous nucleation, which is actually the more common case. So, uh, but first, when do we get a solid? So if I have a, you know, when do I, when I have a bath, like let's say I'm melting copper, very expensive, I don't know why I'm doing it, but I pour in my liquid copper into kind of this cooled mold. So I have, this is my mold. I pour in my liquid metal, it sits here, and it's gonna start to nucleate and form a solid. When is that gonna happen? When do I start to form solid? At what temperature? Well, it's just going to be when the system is undercooled. So delta T is the amount of undercooling. So delta T, this is a very uh, confusing notation, but stick with me. Delta T is undercooling, not to be confused with the degree of supercooling in your DSC lab. So undercooling is the difference between the melting temperature and T. So when delta T, the amount of undercooling is zero, you know that you're at T equals TM. So Make sure, or kind of, you know, note, so when delta T is positive, our temperature is less than, when delta T is greater than zero, our temperature is less than TM. So again, that's just by definition, just to be clear, but again, it's going to be confusing because we we're going to talk about large, under, large amounts of undercooling means low temperature. So it's this kind of semi, you know, uh, obtuse topic initially. So, but that's when we form solid, when, whenever, you know, your material gets below that melting temperature. So if you want to solidify, you put your drink in the freezer, uh, it's colder than your, you know, <laughs> it's colder than it should be. Uh, it's undercooling and you solidify your drink uh, from that melting state. So how can we uh, basically now uh, derive this kind of Gibbs free energy equation to describe this scenario? So let's think about uh, or basically when or like why that solid is going to uh, precipitate, when we're going to get this solid forming. Well, let's think about two different scenarios. So let's think about system one right here. So this is system one, and this is system two. Excuse me for that. So not question mark, I mean system two. So here we just have pure liquid because we know that we're just, just right above the melting temperature. So we have some Particles that are just on the verge of becoming solid, we're just above the melting temperature. And in system two, we're below the melting temperature, so we form that red is our solid part, or some solid, you know, uh, precipitate. So there's particles that we're going to identify as like solid and liquid because they're going to form, but this is when we form our basically precipitate. Maybe our sphere. Spherical. Why? Because it maximizes that volume to surface area ratio. So if I want to figure out What's the difference between these two systems? Specifically, what is the delta G? I'm just going to take the difference between uh, delta G, G2, the energy of my second system, versus the uh, energy of my first system. So it is going to be just G2 minus G1. So let's look at the total energy here. So as you can kind of see in the notes, delta G1, all the energy is just going to come from what's the volume of my liquid. So VL is the volume of liquid. Volume liquid. And you can just read this in the notes too. This is the volume of my solid. And because we're in the liquid state, it's just going to be the free energy, uh, the volumetric free energy of the liquid. So that GL is just the free energy volumetric of my liquid state. 
because that's all I have right now. Pure liquid, no solid precipitates yet. I do have some volume associated with that solid. Don't worry about that. We'll kind of come back to that in a second. My G2, on the other hand, has some additional terms, right? So what's happening here in my G2 state? Well, we could do the same procedure here, right? I know that I'm going to have some volume of liquid, and there's going to be some energy volumetric of liquid associated with that. I'm also going to have some volume of my solid now, and some energy associated with the solid phase here. Now, the other thing here is I've created, like we mentioned before, this interface. An interface that separates my solid and liquid. This is bad. We're going to have to account for this energy term. And we're going to account for it like so. So it's the area of this solid liquid interface, so that entire surface area. So that area times my surface energy or surface tension, gamma SL. That's it. So we got G1, G2. Now we can calculate this. I'm out of room here, so I'm going to go on to the next page. And instead of writing it out, I am going to uh, circle it. So delta G is just G2 minus G1. Here's G2 again. And we are going to get this expression here. So this is just subtracting everything, and we're going to make a couple of key uh, kind of simplifications in order to get this is the term that I want to, we are going to work with from here on out. So delta G equals minus delta G V times uh, the volume of your uh, solid particles plus the area of the solid liquid interface, SL, there's a typo there, times gamma SL. So let's do that here. This is the equation I'm going to work with. Now, delta G V. Delta G V has a couple of different expressions. So this one we're going to save for later. We're going to plug that back in. But we can see kind of in this curve, Sorry for uh, scrolling down here. But we are going to use this expression. Uh, this is just the uh, delta GV is the volumetric change in free energy upon melting. Again, that's just to simply rewrite expression. If you just do this uh, delta G2 minus delta G T1, you'll get here this value plus this. And we're just going to substitute in right here. And that's how we get the minus delta GV. Uh, yeah. So again, we could talk a little bit more about that if you're interested. But again, the note, you know, the derivations in the notes uh, but now, and we'll use this, this is going to be very important later when we talk about uh, basically, again, engineering, engineering knobs to kind of change the behavior. But let's look at this first. So if I'm dealing with spherical particles, what is the volume of my spherical solid? Well, the volume of S is just, of a sphere is just four thirds, four thirds, not pi r cubed. What about the surface area of a spherical of a particle? Well, that's just going to be four pi r squared, right? So I know this. I know this. I could rewrite again and plug this in. Rewrite this expression for a spherical particle, and we're going to get just this expression below. So this is where I want to stop real quick and kind of talk about these two different. There's two competing factors here. So one factor here. This is kind of our interfacial term, or our area term. Notice that, again, we are always trying to get delta G, R. We want to decrease this. We want to make this as negative as possible. R is always going to be positive. Our gamma SL is going to be positive. So again, this is what I was talking about when I was saying, you know, in a couple of videos ago, the energy penalty. So this is our energy penalty. This increases delta G. It makes the reaction not want to go forward. So this is opposing. So this term opposes um, basically solidification or precipitation. Oh, sorry. Opposes solidification slash precipitate. So this does not want to form a solid. It does not want to form any solid particles. Here... Delta G V is always going to be positive. Also, R is going to be positive as well. So this term is our volumetric. This term is going to make delta G R be negative. This is critical because, again, this is the term that drives precipitate forming. So this wants to form a solid. This term is going to... Uh, Basically, as you form a larger and larger volume, 
uh, you're basically minimizing, and we could talk a lot about this more if you take my uh, MEC202, my polymer course, but uh, you're maximizing, you know, it's more energetically favorable. Like you don't want solid, solid particles. Like you don't want lots of little particles all touching liquid interface. That's bad energetically. You want to kind of solidify and kind of bring all of these particles together, make one big solid, because now you're minimizing all these bad contacts. You still have the surface area here. But again, it's more energetically favorable. Again, we have talked about that offline, uh, but or not offline now because it's, everything's online. Anyways, uh, <laughs> we can talk about that later during office hours. But uh, this is the, the key point: is this term drives precipitation, and this term opposes it. So it's this competition between interfacial and volumetric terms. And actually, we're going to see when uh, there's going to be a certain radius, a, cr a, cr a critical radius, where particles are either going to grow or particles are either going to shrink. And we can actually see that uh, on this next page right here. So if you plot this term, uh, don't worry about kind of these axes, these values. Uh, it's just for kind of illustration purposes. But you can see I'm plotting here the interfacial component or the interfacial term right here, the volumetric term here. And there's some point here where one dominates versus the other. So if I have a particle that's, let's say it's like 0 0.1 you know, uh, micrometers. If I put 0 0.1 if I plug that in for r squared versus r cubed, which is going to be larger? At really, really small particle sizes, the interfacial term dominates. This term is going to be larger at small particle sizes. This cubed makes this volumetric term much, much, much smaller. So for small particle sizes, basically between here and here, your interfacial term, this dominates. So again, it doesn't want to basically, you know, what you can think about is, if I have a system here with little, little small particles, I've got created a ton of surface area because they're all really, really tiny. That's not energetically favorable. It's better if I want the larger particles, uh, or that's not energetically favorable in, in the first place, but there's not enough volume here to kind of uh, oppose. Again, it's all about this. Again, your delta G, R term has that interfacial, so minus volume plus interfacial. For the particles to want to grow, this term has to be large enough to overcome this opposing factor here. So at small radiuses, these particles will not grow. And you can kind of see this by looking at uh, basically the slope, right? Because we know that a spontaneous reaction will be when delta G with respect to R here is less than zero. So here, if I take the slope at any of these points, it's positive. Afterwards, it's negative. So in this region, the reaction is spontaneous. Because now your volumetric term is able to kind of cancel out and uh, destroy that energy penalty that we had to pay for creating that interface. But again, we'll get to that in a second. So small particles, they will not grow. Once you get past this R critical, this R star, then the particles will grow because the volumetric term uh, basically overcomes the interfacial energy penalty. So how do we calculate? Like this R star is a very important parameter, right? Because it's going to tell us which particles are going to grow, which particles are going to shrink. Because again, spontaneous reactions, we need our change in Gibbs free energy to be less than zero. So it needs to be, this slope at any point needs to be less than zero. Then it's spontaneous. Here, if I increase, it's, gonna, it's just going to, you know, my energy is increasing, that's not good. So we need this to be less than zero to grow. So how do I find out R star? Well, to me, R star looks like a maximum. And if I want to figure out when it's on which side delta G is less than zero or greater than zero, I need to calculate a maximum. So to find R star, I'm just going to take delta G, take the derivative with respect to R, and set it equal to zero. That is going to give me my R star, which in this case, I'm not going to write it. <laughs> and again, you can kind of talk about this uh, explanation. It says exactly what I did before. So again, if you have any questions, read through the notes or then email me for office hours. So uh Definitely let me know if there's any questions. But do the same thing here, set equal to zero. So my critical radius is this. So this is my critical radius right here. That is going to determine which particles will grow. When R is greater than R star, it will grow. If it's less than R star, it will shrink. So that is going to tell us what's kind of happening here. So now we can start to look at, again, what are some kind of critical parameters in here? So this is where we want to go back to delta GV. We just said just recently that delta GV, we could write it as enthalpy of fusion, delta H, or HF, times 
your undercooling over TM. So, TM, this parameter is fixed. Same thing for this parameter. Once you select a material, those values are fixed. Delta T, again, it's your amount of undercooling. It's TM minus T. This tells us a really, really important parameter on how we can control which particles will grow, which particles will shrink. We can shift. Let's, let's think about what happens to R star. So if, if I have R star, if I make my delta T large, so if I increase my undercooling, that means my temperature is really, really low. What happens to this parameter here? What happens to R star? If delta T increases, my rate, critical radius decreases. It decreases a lot. Why? Again, it's all this, uh, it comes back up to this, this volumetric versus interfacial component. Now there's this kind of driving force where you're getting colder and colder in temperature. Those particles really don't want to kind of be interacting with this uh, the liquid. That is going to shift this critical radius and you're going to be able to nucleate or grow more and more and more particles. Uh, again, uh, as long as diffusion isn't a factor, which we're going to see it actually is in a second. But that is our knob in order to, sh we could shift if we have R star, we could increase R star by decreasing the amount of undercooling or increasing temperature. So that's kind of the, this weird thing. It's this inverse relationship between temperature and undercooling. Make sure you uh, kind of really practice that. It's not an easy concept to figure out. So we could do that, and that's how we can shift. So we can control R star. Additionally, you could plug back in and see what is the delta GR at R star. It's just a simple math procedure at this point, but just to have this is a kind of important parameter. You'll see this pop up in literature a lot. But this, if you plug that back in, you'll see this is the value of your Gibbs free energy. Actually, this is going to be important when we talk about um, compare these values for homogeneous and heterogeneous nucleation. That's be fusion square. So again, you can just plug that in and confirm that math yourself. So that is basically telling us a lot of the key parameters here for homogeneous nucleation. But we could go a step further and actually uh, talk about a couple more parameters. So this is just showing again, we already you know talked about this, delta HF fusion, you could kind of plug that in. Uh, I didn't put the delta there, HF is typically none, but again, you could talk about that a little bit later. So we could also calculate, once we have this expression, once we know kind of these parameters, we could figure out the number of clusters or the concentration of clusters NR here using this expression. So again, as you might uh, as you might not be surprised at this point in this class, it is what with temperature? I can hear you all even over YouTube. It is Arrhenius with temperature. Excellent. I heard you all. Everyone nailed it. So Arrhenius with temperature, the number of clusters. So this is fantastic, but as I kind of mentioned and hinted already, uh, the number of clusters, and as we saw here, with we saw that we could shrink. We could basically grow any particle as long as we just made our undercooling extremely, extremely large. So you might think that, well, if we just are as cold as possible, we could grow any number of particles. But the problem is here that we need to figure out the only way that, you know, in our system, in order for, part for our nuclei or for our solid particles to grow, we need solid particles to diffuse into this cluster. So I kind of already said the word here, I gave it away. So diffusion is also important in this process. And diffusion, we know, has a different relationship with temperature. As delta T increases, increases, and increases, our temperature decreases dramatically, right? And we know that we have this expression, QAT. We have that expression there for diffusion. So if temperature decreases, now my diffusion decreases dramatically. Why are we talking about this? Because we are going to want to think about not only how many clusters that we can grow or we can nucleate, but we need to figure out what is the steady state nucleation rate, uh, I. And that is simply the number of atoms that we can, yeah, that can successfully diffuse to the surface of the cluster multiplied by the concentration of clusters with the critical size. Basically, the idea here is you have clusters that are just on the verge of reaching the critical crust, uh, cluster size. So you just need one more atom to kind of diffuse into there. And then that's when you could kind of, that, that's basically when you have the steady state nucleation rate, like a critical cluster size that will grow. So that steady state nucleation rate is governed by this equation here. So again, number of clusters, just that NR right there, times essentially this gamma, this hopping factor. 
which we've encountered again a lot before in lecture four, that hopping factor is given by this expression here, where now we are given our basically delta G of diffusion. So here, this is basically your equation for D. So the steady nucleation rate is basically this competition between delta GR and this diffusion. So let's think again about what might happen here. So actually, let's take a look at the plot or at a plot of our steady state nucleation rate. So I'm going to scroll down here, skip a couple of lectures. This is basically our plot. Once we you know, combine those factors and you plot this versus undercooling, this is the steady state nucleation rate as a function of undercool. So let's break this, uh, and it shows these kind of two comp uh, components. So delta G is your delta G of diffusion. Delta GR is your uh, homogeneous nucleation, uh, uh, basically, you know, that equation that we've derived here. So let's take a look at this graph because it's extremely important. So on as we increase delta T, so at large delta T, so on basically on this side, I'm draw a line right through the middle here. So on this side of the graph, at large undercoolings, what's happening with the temperature? Well, your temperature on this side of the graph is super low, right? Large undercoolings, low temperatures. On this side of the curve, your temperature is really, really hot. So what's kind of happening here? Why do we have this like shape of the curve where we have this hit this maximum value? Well, it's because there's this competition between those two factors, right? We're fighting between delta G of diffusion and delta G of R. So we've shown that, again, the steady state nucleation rate is how many critical cluster size can we create times, like the, the amount of time it takes to diffuse to that cluster. So let's look at this scenario first in this regime. I'm going to call this regime regime one. So in regime one, we're at really, really low undercoolings. So if we have very, very low undercoolings, we saw that R star was inversely proportional uh, to delta T. So if delta T is really, really, really low, we're only going to be able to grow huge particle sizes. So we don't have really many, you know, basically many critical clusters or, or, or clusters that are close to becoming critical clusters at all. So there's only one or two of these particles here. Now, we're at high temperature. So the diffusion aspect, like these particles can diffuse into these clusters easily, but there's not many that are basically close to that critical cluster size. So here on region one, diffusion is high. So D is large. So particles can diffuse easily, but you're basically your number of clusters is super, super small. You have very few clusters, if any. Now, let's look at region two. Race here. In region two, my delta T is huge. So my scenario now is, I've got tons of clusters that are on the verge of becoming crit you know, critical cluster sizes. But, can the particles diffuse in? Can that, can that one particle diffuse quickly into those clusters? No, because when delta T is really, really large, my temperature is extremely low. So my diffusion is, you know, killed. It's basically super small. But my number of clusters is large. So that's why when we're at these extreme regimes, there's basically no nucleation, you know, or very minimal steady state nucleation rate because we can't create these critical clusters. So you need to find basically this Goldilocks region, this midpoint here where we're not killing off, you know, neither one is too high. So we're not at high enough temperatures where diffusion is dominating. We're not at low enough temperatures where the uh, this is dominating. We are at this kind of Goldilocks region where we're not maximizing either function. But again, by adding these two opposing functions, we're hitting this maximum, this steady state nucleation rate here. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense. Uh, and again, if you have any more questions, but again, this is a kind of a really important uh, kind of parameter and idea here that uh, basically neither region, you know, at the extremes, each, these factors are opposing. Delta GR and delta G diffusion, they're opposing factors. 
But remember where you're at in temperature here and which factors are dominating and why at this middle region, again, neither one kind of kills off the other. So you're nucleating enough rates, but you're also allowing enough, you know, basically your D is large enough to diffuse those little clusters. But we need this Goldilocks region where there's enough clusters, but also the temperature is high enough so that little atoms can diffuse in quickly. These two regions, the extremes are bad. Nice. One more quick note on this uh, uh, before we kind of end it for today. Look at, there's a critical kind of parameter that I really like to point out here. And it's going to help when we talk about heterogeneous nucleation in a second. Look at this gap. So here we're at zero undercooling. So when undercooling is zero, what's my temperature? I heard you all say it. We're at the melting temperature. Why don't we instantly, why don't we start nucleating clusters instantly? Why is there this kind of gap? There's a gap here between here to where you start to form clusters here. This is kind of what I call delta T C or crit. This is your critical amount of undercooling that is required for you to start nucleating any particles. So you see here that delta T crit has to be greater than zero. There has to be some kind of value here to before we start nucleating kind of these particles. Now, this amount, the amount of delta T crit is going to shift depending on the material you choose and on the nucleation uh, method that's being utilized here. So we're going to see in the next lecture how this delta T crit changes depending on whether you're uh, performing homogeneous nucleation or heterogeneous nucleation. So homogeneous... Uh, now, not to kind of spoil everything here and uh, waste your time, but uh, basically <laughs> uh, homogeneous nucleation is not the most common form at all. Heterogeneous nucleation is much, much, much more common. Uh, and we'll talk about why that is uh, in the next video, but I just want to kind of clarify that uh, here and we'll uh, talk more about it, but uh, uh, we'll see why that is uh, uh, in the next video. So uh, again, please stay safe. Uh, if you have any questions on this topic, I know we went through it fairly quickly. If you want some example problems, I'd be happy to uh, make them. So uh, let me know. And uh, yeah, I'll see you all in the next video. Have a good one.